This is Spunky. And Snarky. And we say... Welcome welcome to to the the show. show. everybody happy fourth of july weekend this week we're looking at something very american because what could be more american than murder (laughs) (laughs) we're taking a special look at an episode of murder she wrote with angela lansbury and in this episode their cabot cove patriot mr peabody comes into question whether he was very patriotic or was he a traitor Murder, She Wrote ran for 12 seasons from 1984 to 1996. It's about Jessica Fletcher, who wrote a bunch of mystery books and solved crimes on the side in her small town of Cabot Cove and other places around the world. In this episode, To Kill a Legend from season 11, episode 3, we start off in London and there's this old man and he's getting a file out of a safe talking to somebody, but we don't know who. It's very mysterious. And suddenly he just gets bitch macked to the head from someone we don't know and he falls to the floor he is knocked out and then someone lights a match and sets that room on fire so the place is burning up the roof is on fire and no one has some water water. they just let it burn so off to the side there's this British young person with this greaser mob. Like, he looks like he stepped off the set of Grease 2. <laughs> he was a cool rider. <laughs> he was a cool rider. Because I need a man who can and he's wearing... <laughs> through and through. Oh, oh, oh. True. Okay. Leather gloves, so you know he's up to no good. And he's just watching the place burn. And you're like, hmm. Is he a firebug? Like, what's up with that? So, we don't know what's going on there. But then we enter into friendly neighborhood Cabot Cove. Where we see Jessica Fletcher. She rolled Lynn. They hate in. Because they know that someone is going to get murdered. Yeah. Someone is going to get murdered. Someone is going to get murdered. Someone is getting murdered. She's really just on her bicycle, but whatever. Anyway, so she's in Cabot Cove and the locals are preparing for Joshua Peabody Day. Joshua Peabody is a local legend of Maine, especially Cabot Cove, because he won the Battle of Cabot cove in the revolutionary war so this is like a made-up fictional character that apparently like was a turning point to how america won its independence yeah there's various different episodes of murder she wrote where they mention joshua peabody in the fictional town of cabot cove they're also going to be doing a reenactment of the battle of cabot cove with our favorite curmudgeon seth he's He's like the doctor in the town but he's always got something snarky to say just like me (laughs) He's super old curmudgeon, but he's fun because he's like Jessica's BFF. Anyways, there's also a film crew in town to film a documentary about Joshua Peabody. And Jessica is going to be in it since she's, you know, Cabot Cove's other most famous resident. She's filming a scene where she talks about how Joshua Peabody made music boxes in his spare time when he wasn't fighting in the war. So there's this director who's filming this and he's kind of like a weird perfectionist and kind of a douche and everyone's like talking about him because I guess he won an Emmy like eight years ago but he hasn't done shit with his career since so like this is supposed to be the film that turns his career around so he keeps having things reshot and other people in the crew are just getting annoyed with him but he wants Jessica to turn on this music box while she's talking but guess what it don't work because even in the future nothing works (laughs) So they cut and they go to Cabot Cove's antique shop run by the Godfreys and they're going to try to fix the antique music box so it can be in the shot. So there's Thomas Godfrey who's kind of the tinkerer who is going to fix the music box and then his wife Nancy a redhead and so you know if there's a redhead they're up to no good just saying (laughs) our mom's a redhead so we gotta say that. (laughs) So his wife is putting together the outfits for the reenactment. And of course, Seth, our curmudgeon, is there and doesn't understand why his uniform from last year is so tight. Clearly, something must have happened. (laughs) 
Yeah, I can't <laughs> gain weight over the year. No, no, no. It, sh- it shrunk <laughs> in the back room because of a flood. Wink, wink. That's what Jessica tells him anyway. Jessica's there helping with that stuff. And she had ordered a cabinet that just came in from the antique shop from Vermont. And they kind of pay a lot of attention to this cabinet. And she noticed that the handles are mismatched. And she's like, what's up with that? I paid good money for this. And she's like, oh, no, no, I'll fix it. Don't worry about it. But we're kind of like, what's up with this cabinet? Because they're wasting a little bit too much time yeah, on it. Yeah, because in Murder, she wrote, if they focus on something for a significant amount of time, you know something's up. Because it's going to come back later in the story. Well, anyway, enough about the cabinet. So the guy figures out what's wrong with the music box. There's a little bit of paper shoved inside. That's the reason why it won't work. And Jessica takes the paper and reads it. And it turns out it is a letter from George Washington to Mr. Peabody. And in the letter, he's basically saying that Mr. Peabody, your cowardly request to surrender Cabot Cove is denied. And by the way, we're investigating you because we think you're taking money from the British in order to surrender and you're in trouble. And so everyone's like, oh my God, Peabody is like our hero of the town, but he may be a traitor. They're like, what's this going to do for our tourist industry? (laughs) And this documentary and everything. So they're freaking out. So Jessica goes to the Peabody house, which was Joshua Peabody's old house and is now like a museum. It's run by his descendant, Edith Peabody, and her daughter. Anyway, so she goes to tell Edith about the letter, and Edith is none too pleased. She's like, can't you just destroy this letter? Like, no one needs to know about this. But Jessica insists on having the letter tested to see if it's authentic. Because for all we know, it could be false. It could be just someone playing a prank. Taking it to the lab. Taking Taking it it to to the lab. lab. We need some authentication. So anyways, back at the Godfrey's antique store, Mr. and Mrs. Godfrey are in having a little spat because he blames her for like fucking up Jessica's order and she's their best customer. And she blames him for spending all their money on the Joshua Peabody day when they're pretty much going broke. Nancy storms off in a huff and the mysterious British guy from before wanders in to ask about Dutch colonial pieces, but they don't have any. It's just kind of suspicious that he's in Cabot Cove now. With his leather gloves, just saying. (laughs) So back at the university, Dr. Roy Blakely informs Jessica Morton Seth that at the moment the document looks real, but further tests will confirm it. Mort, who's the sheriff, he worries what it'll do for local tourism, but just finds it odd that this letter was even kept at all, considering that Battle of Cabot Cove was won. It's kind of moot because they didn't surrender. Yeah. Why would you keep something so incriminating? So somehow the film crew finds out about the letter. So the main director, Richard, is just like, whatever, we'll see what happens. But the director of photography, Amelia, she is like, we need to change this documentary because the letter needs to be like the main issue because it's like a cool mystery and people will like buy into this. Yeah, it's like their hook. (laughs) And she hates Richard. So she's trying to tell the producer that he needs to go. He's wasting time and money. And you're the producer. And you're the one who's going to have to bear the brunt if it's a flop. Yeah, pretty much. All right. Back at the sheriff's office, Edith comes in demanding to know why no one has been arrested for planting the letter in her house. Because clearly it is a prank. Yeah, at least according to her. Mort tells her there's no evidence of a break-in or anybody coming on her property to plant said letter. Jessica and Seth then come in saying that they talked to the doctor at the lab and that according to him, the ink is a match for being 200 years old. They can't prove it's a fake, even if it's a good one. Edith then goes off on Jessica saying this is all her fault for not destroying the letter and she's hella rude to Jessica. Jessica just gives her the face like, you're mad and I'm not going to listen to you right now. You're not going to ruin my headspace. Yeah, Jessica, (laughs) she's like, fuck this bitch. But she doesn't say it, but the look on her face says it. Yeah, she's like, it's all your fault. You should have burned that stupid letter. Okay. It's not like you found out Joshua Peabody, like, raped a slave and you have, like, hella descendants. I mean, because that shit happened. (laughs) Uh, So the next morning, it's Joshua Peabody Day. 
And Edith yells at some people because someone put a noose around the Joshua Peabody statue and a sign that said traitor. So she's all pissed off. And there's a bunch of press in town trying to cover the story because somehow they found out about the letter too. Yeah, which was really weird because who told them? But anyway, then the reenactment begins and Richard is filming it for the documentary and the reenactors are there and they have a spat about how they're going to do things. But Jessica kind of like resolves it for them. So they're going to do the first shot and the drummers are drumming and stuff. And all of a sudden this horse gets spooked and almost kills their sound guy. So they have to like restart the shoot. And so they do. But then in this one, the reenactors shoot off a shot and then the director yells cut and wants them to redo it. And then they're reloading the muskets. But then the director's like, why is it taking so long? And he's like, well, there's like hella steps to reload this musket because they don't automatically reload hello so the director like throws a tizzy fit and just stops shooting the producer decides that like this is it we we gotta fire this guy because he's just going crazy and then amelia the director of photography is going to take over in his place The next day, Jessica visits the film company and the sound guy, Scott, he teaches her how like film and sound are recorded on two separate reels from each other. And usually the sound is longer on the reel because there's more sound than there is actual footage. And then they edit it together in post to make a full-fledged movie. And then later, Edith pops around Jessica's house to apologize for blaming her for everything, but immediately takes it all back when Mort, the sheriff, shows up to announced that the paper used in the letter was also 200 years old. This Edith check, can we talk about her for a second? Because she's a real pain in the ass. In a sense, I kind of understand because her like whole family like lineage was like crumbling before her. I but... think she's just like married into the family though. She's not actually like a Peabody Peabody. Oh, well then she just cry cry. <laughs> But clearly she's one of those people who just cares about their status. And she's super entitled. So later that night, the mysterious British guy is standing outside the film production office and sees Edith come out of the office in a huff and disappear into the shadows. And he's like, hmm. Then back at the Fletcher house, Mort and Seth have dropped in for a cup of coffee and to complain about the director when Seth suddenly gives Jessica an idea about checking the mercury levels in the letter. And Mort gets a phone call from Deputy Andy that the film company office is on fire and Amelia Farnham is dead. Boom, boom, boom. So the fire was pretty small. It was just like a trash can fire and they find Amelia's body there. Apparently she suffered a blow to the head and also had this weird cut on her thumb. Scott, the sound guy, shows up and he kind of looks around and discovers that their prop musket appears to be missing. And also he doesn't know where any of the other crew is. So then we move on to the next day and you see Richard and I guess he's been rehired and is back on the job because Amelia Amelia's dead. So job opening. And the British guy suddenly appears and announces himself as Paul Tavaro. And he approaches Richard and he's like, I know what you did last summer (laughs) (laughs) or yesterday. And he's implying that Richard like did the whole thing. And he's like, I know you were going to plant this letter and you killed Amelia. And Richard's like, yeah, great, great. I don't know what you're talking about, but we'll see about that. So back at Jessica's house, the Godfreys deliver the dresser that she ordered and she gets a phone call from the doctor down at the lab and Jessica takes a note of something, but she doesn't say what. And then they transition to the production office where Richard announces that the focus of the documentary is going to change to the Washington letter when Jessica enters and says, don't do that because the letter is a forgery. Everyone is stunned, and Bob, the producer, is quick to blame the whole thing on Richard, but Mort, the sheriff, says they just don't know enough yet to prosecute anybody. Later, Mort gets a call from Andy, who has tracked down the mysterious British guy and is bringing him to the sheriff's office. When they get there, Mort has a fax from Scotland Yard, and he tells the mysterious British guy, who's named Paul Tavano, that he is identified as Jeffrey Caldwell, a world-class forger, and is wanted for questioning for the murder of Alexander Sansby. So Caldwell, he turns out to be the actual author of the fake letter, and he was hired by a guy in London called Alexander Sansby, the guy that got murdered in the beginning. 
But when he saw Alexander had been murdered, he wanted to know who took his letter. So he did some digging and ended up in Cabot Cove. But he doesn't know who hired Sansby to do the letter in the first place. And he says he didn't have anything to do with either murder. But he does know who he saw the night of the murder, Edith Peabody. Boom, boom, boom. So they go to Edith's house and they're like, bitch, what'd you do? <laughs> and she is like, look, I went to see Amelia to beg her not to do this documentary about Peabody being a traitor. But she won't listen. So she left. She's like, I did not kill her. I may have been a bitch to you, Jessica, but I'm not a murderer. But while they're talking, the deputies searched her car and what do they find the missing musket that has blood on it and they're like we gotta arrest you now so she gets arrested and the other people head back to jessica's house to you know powwow the sheriff ends up finding out that the blood on the gun turns out to be amelia's of course but the weird thing is there's no fingerprints on the musket so Jessica is like, this is a little fishy. So she's looking around and she sees her roll of paper towels and it reminds her about the reels of film. And she remembers how they were the same length when Amelia was found dead. So that makes her think of things. And she asks Scott to meet her at the film office. And he confirms that 100 feet of the sound strip is missing. So Scott goes to the Gottfried's antique store looking for the director and the producer and he just happens to tell them that his tape recorder is broken and he can't make the master sound tape that he needs to make. But he took his tape recorder to Portland to get fixed but it should be back by tonight. So later that night at the film studio, the culprit is looking through the sound reels when Jessica and Mort come in to surprise her. The culprit is Nancy Godfrey. After the horse got spooked at the Joshua Peabody day, there was a break in filming and her and Richard, the director, were in on it together and they discussed their scheme at the reenactment, but they didn't know that the shotgun microphone picked up their conversation because Scott, the sound guy, accidentally left his tape recorder running. Because history has its own you. And it hurt you when you were plotting. Just saying. So Nancy admits to hiding the letter in the music box when she was doing an inventory at the Peabody house. Basically, Nancy fell in love with Richard, the director, and they started having an affair. Then they hatched this plot together to revitalize Richard's career so they could both have a fresh start together with money. Everything was going good until the Paul Tavenot guy showed up and started putting two and two together. So she says it's just a prank, but she's been caught red-handed. But wait, there's more. So Jessica also knows that she killed Sansby back in London. And Nancy's like, why? I never. But Jessica's like, "Mm mm-mm, girl. Here's how you did it. (laughs) Basically, she said that she got the dresser that Jessica ordered at the antique shop. She said she got it from Vermont. But when she looked at the dealer's tag, it had a phone number on it that Jessica recognized as being an area code for London. And it traced back to a particular hotel where she found out that Nancy was staying on a holiday, a getaway, running around in London. So much to say. And when they spoke to the dealer in Vermont, they said that Nancy bought the dresser sight unseen. That's why the dresser's pictures didn't match. She happened to also stay at that hotel two months prior, just in time to get Sansby to forge the letter. Jessica then points out a cut on Nancy's wrist where she used to wear her silver bracelet until after the murder. Basically, it flashes to when Nancy killed Amelia. Nancy sees Amelia working on the tape reels and she just happens to hear the part on the reel where Nancy and Richard hash their evil plot. So Nancy confronts her and says, give me that tape. And Amelia's like, no, this is going to make the whole movie. A junkyard dealer and a washed up director doing the forgery of a lifetime. So they get into like a tussle over the tape and Amelia cuts her thumb on Nancy's bracelet and it also cuts her wrist 
this somehow too. And as they're tussling, Nancy grabs the gun that happened to be there and bonks her on the head, kind of like she did with the other guy. Then she's like, oh shit. And Nancy takes the tape and then using some film cleaning solvent, pours it into the film bin and sets it on fire, hoping to destroy all the evidence of murder. So Nancy confesses and says that Richard didn't have anything to do with the killings. It was all her. And the legend of Joshua Peabody is saved for the next 200 years. He wasn't a traitor and Cavett <laughs> Cove can move on with their life. And get that tourist dollar. So Mort and Jessica tease Seth that he better not take off his costume because if he does, he's probably not going to fit into it next year. And Seth is all grumpy, but then they start laughing and it's all good fun because that's just how things go in Cabot Cove. Laugh and chuckle until the next murder. Pretty much. <laughs> and that's the end of the episode. So what were your thoughts on the episode? So it was kind of interesting. There were a lot of twists and turns. Um, it was an interesting plot line considering like, yeah, we always find out shit about our founding fathers that kind of tarnishes their reputation. But, you know, what can you do? They did some fucked up things. Washington had slaves. All that kind of stuff. Politicians do fucked up things now, too. So, well, I that's mean, true, too. Shit never changes. Yeah. Anyways, any other thoughts on the episode or murder she wrote as a whole? Once again, long story short, just get a fucking divorce and move on with your life. I know, really. No need for all this drama and killing people. Yeah. Life choices, people. Life, Life choices. choices. And I'm like, if you got money <laughs> to go to London like twice, like you're not that bad off. Like just, just stay in London and just don't come back. Yeah. Like like I haven't been to London. I'd love to go to London. I'd love to go to London and you don't see me like murdering people to get there. <laughs> I was a little bit worried at the beginning of this episode when we saw the creepy British guy because I fucking hate in mysteries when they show you the culprit in the beginning of the show. I don't know why that just like crossed my cookies. I mean, that's why I can't watch Columbo because that's like their thing. They always show you like who did it in the beginning. I don't know. It just ruins the whole like who done it nature for me. I mean, I don't mind it that much because you still want to know why they did it. I know, like, Law and Order Criminal Intent did that also. Yeah, I mean, it does take away some of the suspense, but then you kind of see the steps that they like, go through to like, avoid the cops and stuff. Because it's almost like if you took a mystery book and you read the last three chapters of the book and then decided to restart it from the beginning. Although, uh, honestly, in this one, they didn't really say that he did it. He's no, 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 just... no, they didn't. I was just worried that they were going to go that route, but thankfully they didn't. He was just a mysterious person. Person. It was a red herring, pretty much. So now you had to figure him out while you're figuring the mystery out. Yeah. I love Murder, She Wrote. I've been a mystery lover since I was a kid. I read my Nancy Drew books. I read the adult mystery books as well. I play my mystery adventure games. Well, we won't talk about the yarn wig. Her blackmail against me. Yeah, she wanted to be a member of the Bloodhound Gang, but that's beside the point. No, I just learned how to make a yarn wig out of a Bloodhound Gang. To disguise gang herself as a hobo <laughs> with white hair. I was like 10, okay? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Okay, so your aspirations were to be a hobo. I was, no, I was in disguise as a hobo to like get secret information. Duh. You were too clean to be a hobo. By the way. <laughs> you know, in the Bloodhound Gang book, they had a, like the newspaper with the hole in it so you can spy on people without them noticing. Yeah, I saw Nowadays, that. the Whatever. newspaper and the hole in it is for something completely different. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> she had to go there. Just saying. America, freedom of speech. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll talk more about some memories in the brain basement. Now it's time for the brain basement. For today, I'm going to talk a little bit about Fourth of July memories. And one of the ones I have is, I think it would have been Fourth of July 96, if my estimation is correct. We had just gotten a computer with a CD-ROM drive, and that was a big deal at the time. And it also had Windows 95, which is also a big deal, at least for me, because I've always been like a computer nerd. I've always been a fan of adventure games. I still am, play them all the time, especially mystery-related ones, like I talked about earlier. In our Father's Day episode, Snarky talked about how her bond with our dad was going to Broadway musicals. Well, my bond with my dad was going to Comp USA on a Saturday. While my dad looked at tech stuff and I was like in the computer game section. 
Anyways, we had bought a bunch of CD-ROM games at Costco and one of those like 20 packs, which one of the CD-ROMs in it was Who Shot Johnny Rock, which is this FMV full motion video for those that don't know. Game where you have to find out who shot this like gangsta guy named Johnny Rock. And it's kind of noir-ish. The object is you go through different scenes and shoot the bad guys. There's like four different suspects. And then finally at the end, you figure out which one did it. And it's a fun game. And this particular 4th of July, I remember waiting for it to get dark and me and Snarky playing the crap out of that game until we could light off fireworks. Another 4th of July memory. Now, this was when I was really little. I was like five and we were doing sparklers in our front yard. And I, me being five, not knowing any better, decided to put the sparkler down on the top of my jacket. And I burned a hole in the hood of my jacket. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah i remember we used to do sparklers a lot and i really like them but when we were little fireworks became illegal where we live but the city like two minutes down the road still has legal fireworks so we were like gonna go to the mall parking lot and do the fireworks there i mean just like little fireworks not but, like, like safe and sane ones little right? sparklers you know little i pick a little piece like little things <laughs> not like big old the m80 or anything <laughs> But yeah, so we were in the mall parking lot and like the security guard came over and was like, you need to get the fuck out of here. And I was like, come on. It's 4th of July and there's nothing around. So it's not like you were going to start a fire or anything. But yeah, and they sell the fireworks at the fucking mall. But whatever. Yeah, that was always (laughs) kind of crazy. And then the next year we'd like be trying to do the sparklers like in our driveway, hoping no one would call the cops on us. Yeah, we saw (laughs) the cops cars come and we'd like run in the backyard. You know, 4th of July is a cool holiday for the fireworks and everything. I'm not a really patriotic person. We're out on the West Coast, so when I go on the East Coast, like, there's so many, like, cool, like, things about the American Revolution and stuff. So it's kind of like you're living in the places where it happened. And so, like, history is there. But, like, over here, there's some historical stuff here, but not a lot. And it's like, don't ask me to name all the 13 colonies because I probably like fuck it up. But I feel like that's most of America. Anyway. (laughs) True. But the only times I really get super patriotic are like, I love the Olympics. I don't generally love sports, but I love the freaking Olympics. And we'll probably talk about that later in three episodes. (laughs) I'm super bummed they got canceled because I was going to go this year. And now I can't because of Corona. But what can you do? Also, I really love Hamilton, the musical. And it, it's so funny to me because I remember that like got milk commercial where the guy he has to answer the question, like, who shot Alexander Hamilton? And he just like ate like a mouthful of peanut butter, like to win the prize money. And like, they can't understand him. I mean, I didn't even know who the fuck Alexander Hamilton was, even though he's on the 10 bill like no one knew who he was and now everyone knows because that musical is so freaking awesome and whether or not hamilton is completely historically accurate you know it still has a lot of lessons about our historical figures and even though we want them to be great heroes they're not perfect i mean washington still had slaves hamilton committed adultery and all these things happened It's a pill we have to swallow as America, and sometimes we forget. Even though I'm not up on American history at all, I feel like most of us aren't, and that's the problem. True. (laughs) And people want to not show things that mention slavery and those kind of things, but I feel like if we don't talk about it and remember it, we're doomed to repeat it. Exactly. I mean, we have to deal with the fact that we had slavery and we had internment camps and we had all sorts of horrible shit, too, just like other countries did. And we need to own up to it. And that'll make us a better America. That's my rant. America's a great place to live. We got education. We got rights. And so that is something we can celebrate. And that's it for the Brain Basement. All right, now for our music spotlight, where today's topic is American songs with America in the title. And first on the list is one of Snarky's favorites, Neil Diamond's America. Because we're coming to America today. Today. (laughs) 
Well, not actually today because you can't get on a flight due to COVID-19. But it's a little reminder that, uh, you know, most of us are immigrants, whether we like it or not. Well, our Italian ancestors came in the 1900s. Our Irish ancestors, I don't really know, but... um, I think they came around the same time, but I'm not really sure. But uh, we're all immigrants. We get the job done. So we should be proud of our heritage. And I'm sorry to all the Native Americans that we fucked over. It's been a bumpy road. So the next song is Grand Funk Railroad. And we're an American band. Because we're an American band. We like lots of American bands. Kiss. Twisted <laughs> Sister. <laughs> And, and then we, we like a lot of not American bands, but the we'll bands. save that for a different list. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Number three is one of my favorite American songs. It's from the movie Rocky Four. It's James Brown living in America. It's a jam. Yeah, who doesn't love James Brown bringing the funk? And it also reminds me of my childhood because I remember the Weird Al parody, Living with the Hernia. Ow. (laughs) Yeah, that's a good jam. All right, and we're on to number four, which is the Guess Who's American Woman. American Woman! Stay away from me! American Woman! You gotta let me be! Very classic. Yeah, Lenny Kravitz did a version in the 90s, I think it was, and his version was really good, too. Moving on to the last American song, my personal favorite in an American classic, Don McLean's American Bye. So bye, bye, Miss American Bye. Drove my Chevy to, to the levee, but the levee was dry. And good old boys was drinking with me and my singing. This'll be the day that I die. This'll be the day that I die. When we were picking the music for this segment, I jokingly said to Snarky, did you want to put the Madonna version? And she gave me the biggest bitch face. I think I deserve to give you the biggest bitch face. I know, I was joking, (laughs) first of all, because her version sucks ass. I like Madonna, but her version was awful. Let's be real. It it doesn't even deserve to be called a version. Let's just put it that way. (laughs) It's not like a version. (laughs) And I'm never going to touch it, ever. (laughs) Don't fuck with the classics, you know, just don't. Yeah, I agree. I remember I was probably in middle school or whatever, and I decided I was going to memorize, like, this whole song. (laughs) And I did, because I'm crazy. I know a lot of the lyrics, too. (laughs) I don't know what the lyrics mean, but I know all the fucking lyrics. Well, I know about the day the music died, which is when uh, Richie Valens and the Big Bopper and Mm -hmm. Buddy Holly. And their plane went down. And they died, and it was very sad. Yeah. Lastly, we do have an honorable mention for this list by a non-American. It's David Bowie, Young Americans. All right. We were the Young Americans. The Young Americans, Young Americans. We were the Young Americans. All right. Why we were picking this list, this song got stuck in my head, like, super hard. Like... (laughs) for a couple days it's a jam what can we say yeah david bowie's great r.i.p by the way died back in 2016 it's very sad and yeah this is one of his 70s jams and he's great lastly i just want to give a shout out to the hamilton soundtrack i've been listening to it in my car since christmas when spunky got it for me And Hamilton has been playing in San Francisco for like over a year. I think I went like six times in the course of the year. I went once when you couldn't go. Yeah, when I was in Delaware on the East Coast. And I was super sad because when COVID came, like they just kind of decided to stop. Well, they stopped showing it, obviously, but also the tour moved on so i don't know when it's going to be back and it was kind of sad but it's a great great soundtrack it's a rapping with lynn manuel and it's got some good tunes i like the burr songs a lot in the room where it happens and the wait for it and there's so many other good songs like psych wait for it <laughs> Sorry, wait for song. it I'm the one thing in that fucking 
control. Anyway, there are so many good jams. It's not even funny. Like, if you ever wanted a cabinet meeting rap battle, it's fucking fantastic. Just give it a listen. I'm sure you can find it on the internet. It's great shit. Yeah, and I think it's going to be premiering on Disney Plus soon, the movie. So you can watch that, and it's going to be probably premiering the same day as this podcast or the day after. (laughs) I'm cheap, so we're probably going to have to find the legal version. Being an internet pirate is very American. Anyway, (laughs) I'm like, how y'all watch Game of Thrones? Like, let's be real. Let's be real. (laughs) How do you think I watch all this content for our whole podcast? (laughs) Okay, no, I, truthfully, I do have a lot of the DVDs <laughs> from this. But you can't know what's up. Come on. <laughs> I'm going to have to watch it eventually. How I watch it, well, that's for me to know. <laughs> and that's it for our music spotlight. If you want to check out the songs in full, you can check them out on our website. So we hope you enjoyed our show today and have a happy 4th of July weekend. Even you know, if you're not American. But we know that times are rough right now in America with COVID spreading and protests going around and emotions are high. We just want to say that Black Lives Matter. We, we see you. We support you. And we hope that... All Americans can strive and have a wonderful 4th of July. Let's all be nicer to one another and wear a face mask, please. You know, just be respectful of others. Don't be a racist asshole. Don't be a racist. Don't be an asshole in general. Just be respectful of the situation that's happening. People have a right to protest. Be respectful of them. Just be kind and just understand that the world doesn't revolve around you. So don't act like an entitled douche. In other words. (laughs) Pretty much. Anyways, on a happier note, have a nice day, weekend, whatever, and we'll see you next time. Eat some barbecue. Don't get sick. You'll be good. So thank you very much. And if you want to drop us a line, you can send us an email at spunkyandsnarkyshow at gmail.com. If you want to visit our website, you can go to spunkyandsnarkyshow.wordpress.com. And if you want to leave us a voice message, you can go to our anchor page, which is anchor.fm slash spunky and snarky show. Bye. Bye.